The text for the sermon this day is taken from Mark chapter 9, specifically these words. It says, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. That is the text. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, little month, little over a month from now will be a big moment. Well, it's kind of a moment, a special moment. On that date, so I don't know if we have, I can't see any seventh graders, but our seventh graders who have lit their, they've done the acolyting, they have not yet to this point lit this candle right here. But in a little over a month, it will be lit for the first time since May. And the reason is, is because on, back in May, we celebrated Ascension Day, or a little bit, a couple days later, we celebrated Ascension on Sunday. But as we heard the reading of Jesus ascending into heaven, after that reading was read, this candle was extinguished. And it has not been lit since then, with the exception of a baptism, which we did have last night, but I'll get to that later. And so we've been in anticipation, waiting to light this candle again. And so, in a little bit over a month, on December 24th, we're going to be all gathered here, and there's going to be people we haven't seen in a long time, and we're going to be singing those old Christmas carols, and we'll hear, eventually hear from Luke 2, the good news of great joy that born in this city is Christ our Lord, and that candle will be lit. And leading up to that, even starting next week, we're going to actually have an Advent wreath. We have a wreath right around it. And there'll be four candles, three that are violet, one that is rose, not pink, because Jesus rose from the dead. He did not pink from the dead, so it's rose-colored. But it, those candles will be lit, serving kind of like a clock, counting down the weeks until it is lit. And we'll be at Christmas. But here's the thing. I can't sit here and just watch that candle and wait for it to be lit. I cannot sit here until December 24th staring at it. Or, for example, how many of you have your Christmas tree up already? Don't worry, it's not a judgment statement. Don't worry. If you're waiting until next, on, how many are going to have it lit, put up this week? In theory. Anyways. If you put it up, it does no good to sit there and stare at the tree, waiting for the presence to appear. You have things to do. You're going to have, you're going to have to get things ready. You're going to have family come. You have to do basic things like go to work, go to school. You have to do all these basic things that you do every other week, every other day, in between now and then, and not to mention all the things that go with Christmas. And not to mention, by the way, Thanksgiving's this week. We have that. See, the reason why that candle is extinguished on Ascension Day is because on the day of Ascension, the disciples were on the mountain. They were with Jesus. And Jesus had accomplished everything he had set out to do. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He... He walked about preaching, teaching, and doing incredible miracles. He eventually was crucified under the order of Pontius Pilate. He, was di he died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead. And then after 40 days, he showed himself physically risen from the dead to over 500 people. And now, having accomplished all of that, he ascends into heaven. And the disciples, they're standing there staring. Where are you going? Coming back? Which, let's face it, if you saw somebody ascend into heaven, you'd be like, what's going on? What's, what's going on, dude? They're looking up. And so the disciples, so as they're staring up into the sky, wondering what's going to happen, is Jesus coming back, the angels appear and tell them, Men of Galilee, why do you gaze into heaven? 
For this Lord who has departed from you will return in the same as he left you. And then that leads back to what Jesus told them before he ascended. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. See, yesterday evening, we had a baptism. So, Cherish Meisner was baptized. And you might be surprised, but when she was baptized, she was not immediately taken up into heaven that very second. Which, if that happened, that would be incredibly, insanely awesome. But that's not what happened. And that didn't happen when any of you were baptized. None of you, when you came to faith, were brought straight up to heaven because you have a task. You have something that God has called you to do, and that is to serve him and serve your neighbor. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, if anyone wishes to be his disciple, they must deny themselves pick up their cross, and follow him. In today's reading, he says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Quite against the way of the world. In the world, we are told that greatness is based upon success, financial success, glory of victory. But... In Scripture, the greatest are those who are servants. Jesus again would later say, only a chapter later, that remember the Son of Man did not come, even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Or in that kind of familiar text of the sheep and the goats, Jesus says, when I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was naked, you did not clothe me. When I was thirsty, you did not give me something to drink. To which they will say is, when did we not do these things for you? And Jesus said, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Even the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians that you are to do nothing from selfish desire. Instead, you are to consider others more significant than you. You're supposed to have a mind like that of Jesus, who humiliated himself, humbled himself, by becoming, becoming a servant, becoming obedient even to the point of death. The reason why we are not taken into heaven as soon as we are converted is because God has placed, has you here to serve him. To serve your neighbor. Because God's design and the way that he brings people to him is through you. I'm reminded of a story of a, and I, maybe I've said this before, I don't know. But there's a story of a man who was on a house during a flood. And he had prayed during, before the flood as the flood was happening, he's praying, God, deliver me from this flood. Well, then a man came by just on the street, and the water was starting to come up, and he says, hey, I got a car. Why don't you hop in with me, and we'll get, we'll get away from this flood. He says, oh, no, no, God's going to save me. Then he prayed again, God, won't you deliver me? At this point, the water was, up to the, was almost to the roof. And a man comes by in a boat and he says, Hey, I can, hey why don't you come with me? We could, we could get away from this. He says, Nah, nope, nope, God's going to save me. And so he prayed again. And this time there was a helicopter that came along and said, Hey, you're going you're gonna to drown. You've got to come on to this helicopter. He says, Nope, I trust God. He is going to save me. Well, he eventually drowned. And he was there to see God, and God, he said to God, he says, why did you send anybody to help me? And he said, well, I sent the man in the car, I sent the man in the boat, and the man in the helicopter. The point is, 
God works through people. Martin Luther would refer to this as the masks of God in your vocation. So that your vocation, the obvious ones where we could go with, we could talk about how you work at, maybe you work at Gomeco, you work in Midwest, you work at the bank, you work at the hospital, you work at the schools, you're a student. Whatever it might be, that's an obvious vocation. But we also could talk about your role as a parent, as a child, as a grandparent, as a grandchild, as a sibling. We also could, but it also is your role as neighbors, as friends. Even your hobbies can become a vocation. So if you enjoy golfing, and you go out golfing quite often, believe it or not, that can be used, that is a vocation. And those are all places that God has placed you for opportunities and ways to serve him. Like, for example, the hobbies, I always like to use the example of a group, it's called, it's on Twitch. It's called God Mode Activated. It's a group of about 300 pastors who stream while playing video games and witnessing and talking about the gospel. And it's actually kind of amazing. There are quite a few stories of people who came to faith through those conversations just while playing something like Destiny or Fortnite or Apex Legends or whatever. But also, but see, all of your life, your careers, all these different places are places that God has put you to serve the gospel. Because as we began, on the, as we began this stewardship campaign, we read that first text that we are fellow workers. We are all working together to God's glory. Working together to serve his kingdom. So we do this in the church. We do this by being, contributing musically. Whether it be organ, praise band, praise team, children's music. We contribute by teaching Sunday school, midweek. We help with youth group. We help usher. We're a secretary. We help in so, there are so many, many different ways. Being on a board, board of evangelism, board of um, stewardship, board of missions, being an elder. All ways that you, in your gifts, and your abilities, God can call you to work together to serve him. We serve also by helping organizations. We help things such as Orphan Grain Train, which if anybody who doesn't know where Orphan Grain Train is, go to Ida Bull, look across the railroad tracks, and it's right there. So help, you could, you find yourself available on a Tuesday morning, go help and help fold some clothes or whatever. They are always needing of volunteers. You support missionaries, support mercy meals, which sends food to people around the world, support our, the community basket. As our hymn we just sang, verse 2, it says, Still your children wander homeless, still the hungry cry for bread, still the captives long for freedom, still in grief we mourn our dead. As, O oh Lord, your deep compassion, heal the sick and freed the soul. Use the love your spirit kindles, still to save and make us whole. You are on this earth for a purpose. To serve the gospel. To serve your neighbor. This is echoed all throughout our catechism. This is echoed all throughout the scriptures. You are called to serve. We cannot be just sitting and watching the candle. We cannot just be looking to the sky, waiting for Jesus to return. Hopefully he will kind of find us busy doing what he has called us to do. But here's the thing, as I go through this, this is what we do call law. 
its third use of the law, how we live as Christians, those who've been bought by the blood of Jesus. But the funny thing about the law is the law always does what? Accuses. So as I'm going through this, you're hearing what you, way we should be living. There's also the other part of you know that we are not living as the Christian that we should be. And so we are waiting for Christ's return. On December 24th, we celebrate that Christ came born of the Virgin. But we also remember that we come here. And here Christ comes to us. The reason why that candle is lit at a baptism, like it was yesterday evening, is because in baptism, you are clothed with Christ. And Christ also comes to you in the bread, in the wine, for the forgiveness of your sins in the Lord's Supper. Christ comes to you when you hear the word spoken to you, proclaimed to you. He still comes to you in this world, and he brings you forgiveness, he brings you grace, he brings you mercy, and he brings you strength to live out your vocation. You cannot live in your vocation separated from the means of grace. You must be in the word. You must be in the sacrament. Because the more you withdraw yourself, the more you cannot be what he has called you to be. This is the fuel, so to speak. It's the forgiveness for when you fail. But it's also the fuel to strengthen you for your service. So we come here... The bells ring just as you enter, coming in from the mission field, and you are filled, fed by the word of God, fed by his grace. And the bells ring again at the end, sending you out, back to your vocation, back to your mission of service. December 24th, that candle will be lit. And at the very, in the little, towards the end of the service, you know that moment we look forward to, well, many of us look forward to, the, can, the church is darkened, and you all have your candles. And we start with this one. From this candle, my, whichever pastor lights it. We go up here, and the ushers light that from that candle, and goes around and lights all of yours. All of you bearing a flame that began at that Christ candle. Why? As you, and as you sing Silent Night. Why? Because you bear the light of Christ. You are Christ. You are bear the mask of God. You are Christ to your neighbor. You are on this earth for that reason, to be his face, to be, to serve in his name, to serve those who are in need, and ultimately to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, to bring, bring the good news that leads to salvation. Remember, your job is not to convert anybody. You can't do that. But your job is to tell people, to tell people of Christ. Your job is to serve others. We can't keep watching the candle. We can't keep watching to the sky. We are here to serve. And we keep coming back to his word, keep coming back to his sacrament for strength and forgiveness when we fail. May this be our life as fellow workers, as working on this team, in Christ's kingdom, till he returns. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace, peace, and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep you in the one true faith, to life everlasting.